Hey everyone, this is Adriana from Rody Free Radio. In this clip, Larry talks to Sandy Warren, co-writer and executive producer of Horn from the Heart, and David Dunn, author of Guitar King, at a panel discussion about Michael Bloomfield and Paul Butterfield. Here, these three discuss the genre shift in the music industry and the rise of rock stars and downfall of the blues. In addition, they go further into Michael Bloomfield's decline in being known as the guitar god, as he began to explore and perform his other interests from playing piano to acoustic guitar. If you want to hear more about Bloomfield, make sure to check out the full episode number 151 from November 28th, 2019. Thank you for listening. Thank you for subbing. Here is Larry. As the late 60s gave way to the big rock stars and rock stardom and Zeppelin and over-the-top shows and whatnot. Some of these guys kind of drifted. The the blues, pure blues like this sort of took a a back seat for a while. Then rock stardom gave way to punk music and then new wave early 80s. By that point, we lost these guys. There's a piece in your film, someone says, if you just hung on, Right, who, who says it? David Sanborn. You say Sanborn again, said, right. You know, we're, he was talking Sanborn about, said everything that I liked in that movie. <laughs> it was awesome. He was talking about how, you know, there came a time when blues wasn't, you know, selling and there wasn't a whole lot uh, of interest. And he said, you never know that if you lay low and you wait, you know, the world turns a few more times, the zeitgeist changes, and you never know, you end up in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. So it's sort of like if only Paul could have hung in there, but... Yeah. Not like he made a decision not to, but anyway. Do you think Michael would have stayed, or was it was his temperament and his uh, her, were his demons a bit stronger to keep him out of it? I, I think that's the latter is more the case. Um, in 1978, he had he had just recorded an album with a group called KGB. And uh, it didn't work out well. Um, it was a band of supposed superstars with Rick Gretsch and, um, oh, I forget the other players. But um, John, no, that was, that was earlier. No, that was a triumvirate. triumvirate yeah. uh, that was earlier. But, uh, but so it was, it was Rick Gretsch and the drummer from Vanilla Fudge and a, a number of other players. Uh, it was produced uh, by MCA, which by that time was, you know, the, the company that uh, put out Elton John and had uh, uh, many, many high-end pop acts, and they were, I don't know what they were doing with Michael, but uh, Michael gave an interview shortly before the record was released with the Los Angeles Times, where he basically trashed the entire thing and said it was a scam and it was, he only did it for money because he, in fact, owed a lot of money to the IRS and they were going to take his house if he didn't do it. So uh, and this was published and he later regretted being so candid about it. But MCA said, you know, this guy is done. We, forget it. He's poison. We won't touch him anymore. And that was fine with Michael because he went off with his friend Norman Dayron and they issued a number of records on small labels, some of which were better than others. But I think by the time uh, he passed in 1981, uh, he had really, I, I think he was tapped out. Uh, he would have continued to play music, undoubtedly. He would never have uh, returned to the heights of uh, supersession in the 60s, and I, maybe Paul was similar in that regard. Um, I think For Michael, uh, he had found what he really liked in music, which was all kinds of music, not just blues, but he was characterized as this guitar god, blues guy, who had recorded with uh, Al Cooper, Super Session with Butterfield. Um, And that really wasn't who he was by the late 70s. He liked to play piano, so he would play a set of piano. He liked to... uh, play acoustic guitar. In fact, when he was invited by the Newport Jazz Festival, which was by that time Newport in New York, uh, 1975, and he played the first concert in, in the festival series, which was called Midnight Blues, also featured Bobby Bland and Muddy Waters and I think B.B. King. Uh, Michael opened the show, and it was at Radio City Music Hall, and he walked out onto the stage, and if you've ever been there, it's a huge Art Deco stage with a great, huge uh, awning over it, and 
there was a little chair there, and he sat down in a chair, pulled out an acoustic guitar, and began to play <laughs> these recreations of Blind Blake tunes. And meanwhile, the place is packed with 5,000 people, and they're expecting super session. And so, so this is where Michael was going, and it was not what people expected to hear. And the only thing they knew about him was that he was the guy who, in 1968, recorded this great record, and they all loved it and knew it well, and they expected that. But that was not what he gave them. And more and more, it became a real problem. And more and more, he was less interested in doing stuff to please the audience and his managers and his record company. He was just going to play his own thing. And I, so I do think that, that that whole guitar god thing was pretty much done for him, had he lived. What do you think his impact on the guitar was, the electric guitar? Where do we begin? I mean, really, uh, I'm, uh, fans of Michael Bloomfield know that uh, he really was the first guy to stretch the limits of what, what we consider acceptable in pop music as you know, guitar. Prior to Michael Bloomfield, you had Dwayne Eddy and a few others who were twangy guitar players, and they would play instrumentals. But their tunes would be two minutes long, three minutes long, formulaic. They would have a recognized melody. They would be a little improvisation in the middle. Generally. Guitar players were incidental to the vocalist. So in pop and rock and roll, you know, the guitar or soloist, whoever he was, was just there to liven things up, and then the vocalist would come back in, and that's who you were there to see. After Bloomfield, you were there to see the guitar player. I mean, it didn't matter that Bloomfield couldn't sing. It's what he played. And that, I think, is, uh, you know, there are other... Um, Musicians who were doing the same thing, particularly in England, Clapton, Peter Green, and uh, some of the other players, Jeff Beck, certainly. But Bloomfield, the stateside, was, and Bloomfield was almost before any of the English guys, because the Rolling Stones issued their first record in 64, and, you know, whatever you think of, uh, of uh, their playing, they weren't really blues players, and they weren't, they were, they were a rock band, they were singers, you know. Mick was a singer and Keith played a little bit of electric guitar but not, not wasn't a soloist in the jazz sense of being a soloist, which Michael was, very much so. And Paul as well, very much so. And that, I think, uh, is the impact that both these great artists had on the music was after Newport, if you were a serious guitar player, you had to be able to solo. You couldn't just play chords and have a nice voice you had to be able to solo, and you had to be able to solo as well, or an approximation of Bloomfield. And I, I think that that really changed the landscape for, uh, and gave birth to endless, uh, you know, guitar players who soloed way too long and too frequently, but that's where it started. Or bands that used the wrecking crew because they didn't have a, Because the, they couldn't do it. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, what's happening, roadies? It's Larry here. Just wanted to thank you so much for listening to this short clip. I really hope you got something out of it. If you can take two seconds to head over to iTunes and drop us a review or a comment, we would greatly, greatly appreciate it. Keep listening. Keep coming back. Stay healthy out there. And remember, no roadies, no rock and roll.